Theory class is now in session. Today class, I will be explaining general relativity on an Einstein Rosen bridge. Jesus Christ, that sounds boring. Oh really? So what do you want to learn about? Explosions and crashes! What kind? Big ones. Huge big ass ones. <sighs> Fine, give me a series, an object and an action. How about Ruby? Uh, Atlas! Falling. <laughs> okay, scenario. Someone removes the relic of creation from the Atlas vault, so now there is nothing keeping Atlas afloat, and nothing is done to slow Atlas's descent. Let's calculate the resulting destruction. Now that's what I'm talking about. Right, let's see. First we need to know how big Atlas really is. So, we need a ruler. Well, I have Mongol ruler Genghis Khan, or a tape measure. No, I mean an in-canon ruler, an object or person we know the height of. Well, we know the canon heights for all of Team Ruby, as well as Jean, Nora, Ren, and Ironwood. Weiss and Jean will do nicely. How tall are they? Weiss is five foot three, and Jean is six foot one. In metric? <sighs> Fine. One point six meters and one point eight five meters. Right then. If we use Weiss and Jean as rulers in this scene, we get a door width of two hundred and fourteen centimeters using Weiss and two hundred and ten centimeters using Jean. Now. 4 centimetres may not seem like a big difference, but let's call it 212 centimetres so we're as accurate as possible. If we rewind that scene, we get a shot of the door flat on, so we can work out the ship's height is 3.088 metres. Fast forward the footage a bit, and now we can work out the height of the landing pad. 8.4215 meters. Now, on a completely different scene, we can use the landing pad to work out the height of one of those door towers. I'm using this landing pad because it appears to be about the same distance away, giving us a door tower height of about 129.9833 meters. Now we're getting somewhere. Using the door tower, we can work out that the centre tower of Atlas Academy is roughly 1,154.5506 metres tall. That's 1.39 times taller than the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building on planet Earth in 2020. But I'm not done yet. Using the centre tower, we can calculate that Atlas is roughly 13,524.6366 metres tall. That's 1.52 times taller than Mount Everest, the tallest mountain on planet Earth. Damn, that escalated real quick. I'm only just getting started. Using the official concept art, we can work out that Atlas is about 35,485.2087 metres wide. Then using the round thing on the bottom as reference, we get a length of 31,784.1451 metres. <gasps> but now, we need volume. <laughs> <laughs> Get it? Volume? Uh, anyway, it's height times length times width. Yes, but actually no. That's how to calculate the volume of a cuboid. But lass, Atlas is no basic shape. I wouldn't even know where to start by calculating the volume. But I know who might. Armstrong, I need you. in the wall. That's not important. Armstrong, using these calculations and reference images, make us a model of Atlas. Sir. Yes, Armstrong? I am done. Brilliant. 
Now, move everything that's not Earth. Perfect. Now, what is the volume of that object, Armstrong? The volume is 5,443,772 meters cubed, sir. Nice one. You can go now, Armstrong. Now that's a lot of volume. But what's this got to do with Atlas crashing into the ground? Well, I'm working out all the things we need to solve this. Force upon impact. First, we need to finish calculating M, which in this equation is mass. Because if we take the volume we just calculated and times it by 3.4 grams per centimetres cubed, which is the density of surface level Earth, we get a mass of 1,850.8824 tonnes. So it's like a jigsaw. All the parts have to be in the right places in order to see the full picture. Exactly. But now we need to work out the weight of the buildings and people. To get a rough area of the buildings and people, I'm going to minus Atlas's length from Atlas's width, divide the number by 2, minus that number from the width, giving us a diameter of a circle with about the same building area as Atlas. And using good old pi r squared, we get an area of 888,514.2586 kilometers squared. That's an area of over 129,000 football pitches. Don't ask me how I know that. Now, Atlas's skyline is full of skyscrapers and high-rise buildings, and it may look like something that could only exist in fiction. But look at Hong Kong's skyline, and you will see an extremely similar view. So, let's use Hong Kong to calculate Atlas. Hong Kong has 9,756 buildings over an area of 1,106 kilometres, as you can see here. So, if we divide Atlas's area by Hong Kong's area, we find it is 803.3582 times bigger by area. Now, I know there's more than just skyscrapers and high-rise buildings in Hong Kong, but the very few buildings left would make so little difference to the calculation, I might as well add them to the high-rises. And after doing the math on that, we get... 1,346,428 skyscrapers and 6,491,134 high-rise buildings on Atlas. The only skyscraper I can find the weight of is the Empire State Building at 365,000 tonnes and a weight of 76,800 tonnes for a high-rise building. After plugging in the numbers, we get a total weight of buildings and the bottom rings of 998,965,311,200 tonnes. And finally, people. Now, to work this out, I turn to Fort Bragg, the world's biggest military base, which has an area of 160,640 acres or 650,087.015 kilometers squared, occupied by 260,000 people. Dividing Atlas by Fort Bragg, we find out that Atlas is only 1.36676.2044 times bigger. Timesing the amount of people by that, we get an Atlas population of 355,358 people and given the average weight of a person is 62 kilograms that gives us a people weight of 22,032.196 tons. That gives Atlas a total weight of 98,996,000 535,080 tons. That equates to around 62% the weight of Mount Everest. <laughs> no wonder you need the power of a god to lift it. So we have worked out the M, or mass. So now on to V. V, for very awesome people that subscribe. Close, it's velocity. The rate or speed that something is travelling, in this case, downwards. 
To calculate velocity, we need to know time, and to calculate time, we need to know acceleration. Hold it! Acceleration? But acceleration requires an external force to push or pull an object in a direction, in this case downwards, and the scenario didn't include external forces. Ugh, oh, saying it out loud makes it really obvious. It's gravity, isn't it? Yeah, remnants gravitational pull, something that should be constant around the entire planet. Should, because here are three clips I found to easily calculate gravity from. <laughs> but doing the maths on those three gives us, for the Yang Cup scene, 2.6901 meters per second square. For the Ozma falling scene, 47.182 meters per second squared, and for the bullet dropping scene, 5.67 meters per second squared. Just to put those numbers into perspective, the moon's gravity is 1.62 meters per second squared, Earth's gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared, and Jupiter's gravity is 24.79 meters per second squared. Remnant's gravity is all over the place. But I propose an idea that sort of fixes this inconsistency. I propose that the animators of Ruby aren't even thinking about how much gravity they're putting the characters under. Because when something is dropped from a small height, we expect it to hit the ground in less than a second. Any time longer looks slow motion and anything faster looks sped up. So I believe that they are relying on their own personal experiences with gravity to judge it. And unless any of the animators have ever been to space, the gravity they will be used to is 9.81 meters per second squared. That very well may be true, but preconception clogs real thinking. Do you have anything from the show that suggests this to be true? I mean, Remnant and Earth seem very different. On a surface level, this is true. But look deeper, there are more similarities than you might realise. For example, all of Team Ruby's birthdays have been confirmed to a Gregorian calendar, meaning that Remnant's years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes and seconds are exactly the same as the ones we use today on Earth. Meaning that Remnant also takes 365 days to orbit its sun. I mean, did you know that Remnant has a tilt just like Earth? Remnant clearly must have some kind of tilt, as it has seasons. But I have no idea how to work out how much. Imagine an orbital line that goes around the sun and a line that goes around the equator. That difference in degrees is the Earth's tilt. And you know Remnant has this because... Port's globe because globes are always at a 23.5 degree angle because of this tilt. If we really zoom in on this globe at an angle, you can see it's pretty much the exact same angle. But while we're talking about the planet, it also has a magnetic field that protects remnant from solar flares, because in Mantle, a very northern location, we see an aurora, or, as you may know it better, Northern Lights. And, don't forget, it also has an atmosphere that creates a blue sky and holds breathable air. Do you know how many planets in the known universe have those exact same things? Um, 42? One! And it's called Planet Earth! But, if you're still not convinced, let's take a trip back to Volume 1. Think back to Forever Fall. It has been a while, but I remember it. Describe the trees. Well, they're red, hence the name, and they produce a sweet edible sap and look to be around 20 foot in height. Sounds to me like Acer Palmatum, or Japanese maple. Colour red, edible sugary sap, grows in woods from East Asia to Japan, and grows to a height of 19 to 26 foot. Which is exactly what we see. If the gravity were as high as 47 meters per second squared, the trees would be much smaller because it would just be wasting energy to grow up. 
Whereas if the gravity were 3 meters per second squared, the trees would be much taller as it would take less energy to grow up. So because the trees are the height they realistically should be, the same can be said for the gravity? Now you're getting it. Couldn't you have just said the same thing about the humans? Oh yeah, that would have been easier. But for the rest of the video, we will be using 9.81 meters per second squared as remnants gravity. Anyway, calculating time. If we take this equation and rearrange it a bit, we find that time equals the square root of distance times two over acceleration. Now, the distance we need is how far Atlas will fall. Using this long shot, we can find out that Atlas is about 15,323.41327 meters high in the sky, which is only about half the height at which planes fly. So, plugging these numbers into the formula gives us 55.8931 seconds of falling in a vacuum. A vacuum? Like a Henry or a Dyson? Kinda, but being in a constant zero atmosphere is in a completely theoretical state. You don't have to understand this bit, just follow along. Now we can work out Atlas's velocity in a vacuum using this. It may seem confusing, but it's quite simple. fx is the final distance and ix is initial distance. Well, the final distance is 15,323.41327 meters and the initial distance is zero meters because that's the point at which we will start falling from. And with the time we just calculated of 55.8931 seconds, we get a velocity of 274.1557 meters per second. Oh, nice. Now we just have to add that into the equation mentioned before. Not so fast. That's the velocity in a vacuum, meaning there's no drag, air resistance and friction. But for that, we need to work out roughly the surface area of the bottom of Atlas. Now, I would have to have the original rooster teeth model for this to be perfect. So I'm compromising with a half spheroid, or in other words, half a squished ball. Now, I have no idea how to calculate that, but luckily the internet has a calculator for that. And after feeding it the numbers, it gives us a surface area of 2 billion, 173,057,662.62 meters squared. Which, if we divide by two, because we're only using the bottom half, gives us 1,866,528,833 meters squared. Whew. Now we can work out fluid drag. What's that then? Have you ever tried running in a swimming pool? Do I look like someone who's stupid enough to run in a swimming pool? Yeah, it was really tricky. That's because of fluid drag. You have to push the water out of the way in order to move. That's why it's easier in shallow water. Less water to move out the way. Okay, I get that now. But what's that got to do with this theory? Well, have you ever stuck your hand out a moving car? Same thing. Any substance that flows is considered a fluid. Now, the formula for fluid drag is FD equals half rho V squared CDA, with rho being the density of the fluid, V being velocity of the object in a vacuum, CD being drag coefficient, and A being surface area. We have velocity and area, but don't worry, the other two are super easy. The density of air is 1.24 kilograms per meters cubed and drag coefficient is just to do with the shape and I would say Atlas is somewhere between a cone and a half sphere so I'll call it 0.45. Put it all together and we get 22 trillion 784 billion 527 million and 60,000 newtons. And here's where it comes in useful. Mg minus Fd equals Ma, or mass times gravity minus fluid drag equals mass times acceleration. 
And that acceleration is what we need because that's the acceleration of Atlas with air resistance. So putting in the numbers, we get MA to be 948,371,482,100,000. And if we divide MA by M, we get A, simple giving us an acceleration of 9.57 metres per second squared. 9.57 metres over second squared? That's only 0.24 metres over second squared slower than before you added air. It may sound like a small difference, but when we're using really big numbers, it makes a huge difference. If we had applied it to something like Yang's glass dropping scene from earlier, a small drop from a small object, there really would be a very tiny difference. But Atlas is no small object. Now we have to kind of repeat ourselves. We need to get time and velocity with the new acceleration. But I'll do it quick. Full time equals 56.5896211 seconds and velocity equals 270.781337 meters per second. Now can we work out the impact force? We can, but first I want to know how hot Atlas will get. <whistles> Due to friction, let's see. Using Ke equals mv squared divided by 2 gives us 3.6 quadrillion degrees Celsius or 6.5 quadrillion degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 241 billion times hotter than the centre of the sun. So everyone on Atlas would be burned alive. Now that's a grim situation. <coughs> Not necessarily. Most of the heat would be on the bottom, but anyway, time to get into the bit we've all been waiting for. Force upon impact equals mv squared divided by 2 times sd. 98,996,535,080,000 times 270.781337 squared divided by 2 times... Um, well, cell distance is just the amount it goes into the ground. Well, 20 metres sounds about right. Okay, that gives us, drum roll, 188 quadrillion, 466 trillion, 916 billion, 400 million newtons upon impact! <sighs> Why are you all so quiet? It's a big number, but what does it mean? Put it in ways even Jordan would understand. Hey! Oh, okay. I can do that. Well, if we take our Newtons and divide them by 9,806,650, that gives us it in kilotons. One kiloton is equal to a thousand tons of TNT. Anyway, that gives us 18,504,475,677.22 kilotons. Which, with the help of Newt Map, we can use to get an idea of how bad it would be. There's just one problem. Newt Map only goes up to 10,000 kilotons, but we can still use it to get a rough idea. I made a graph that goes beyond, so we can at least have some idea how bad it is. And using the chart, we can see that the 1 psi overpressure travelled 1,448 kilometres in diameter. So let's see how bad this is. If you were within 15.8 kilometres or 9.8 miles of the centre of the blast, you'd be crushed. If you were in 23.8 kilometers or 14.7 miles of the center, you and everything on the surface is destroyed. Everything that was you is no longer. If you were within 15.6 kilometers or 31.4 miles, you're dead, but your body may be able to be recognized if you're lucky. 135.3 kilometers or 84.7 miles away, 
The blast won't kill you, but buildings could easily fall on you. 278.7 kilometres or 173.1 miles away breaks windows and destroys weak buildings. And 724 kilometres or 449.8 miles away, glass is likely to break. And even though you could be hit and feel the shock wave, you might not even be able to hear the crash. You're too far away. Assuming that remnant is the same size as Earth, at 724 kilometers away, you wouldn't even be able to see Atlas normally because it would be below your horizon line. But what about everyone on Atlas? That's what we want to know. Well, if you were too close to the edge, you'd probably be blown off if you were lucky. Otherwise, you may be burned alive. But any unfortunate soul that is still on Atlas when it hits the ground may be killed by deacceleration, experiencing between 30 and 55 Gs of force on their body. That's assuming that Atlas doesn't explode into millions of pieces, which would probably increase the number to 80 to 90 Gs. Assuming you were on Atlas or Mantle without an airship, I'd say your chances of survival are less than 5%. Damn, that's a lot of damage. But what if it was even worse? Let's change one small thing. The height at which Atlas starts. Let's say in this scenario, Ironwood got his way and lifted Atlas high up and then it got dropped. How high are we talking? 167,378.9251 metres plus. Where on Remnant did you get that number from? Well, using our past calculations, I was able to work out that Atlas had a terminal velocity of 1,789.8711 metres per second. And to get to that speed, you would need to be at least that high up. Listen to me. I know this one. Terminal velocity is the maximum velocity attainable by an object as it falls through a fluid like air. It occurs when the sum of the drag force and the buoyancy is equal to the downward force of gravity acting upon the object. Yeah, I was just going to say it's the point things can't go any faster, but that was way more accurate. Well, using this formula to calculate terminal velocity and all the other math we did earlier, we get... 808,505,566,936.72 kilotons upon impact. Which, if we plot onto our graph, gives us a 1 psi overpressure in diameter of 10,950 kilometers. Which would look like this on Earth and this on Remnant which you may notice goes off the map, because this is so big, in reality, it would go over the North Pole. So, this is not perfect to show what it would look like, but I still think it gets the point across. So, let's see how bad it is this time. 15 kilometers, crushed. 180 kilometers, you dust. 338 kilometers, most people die. 810 kilometers, damages buildings. 2,107 kilometers, damages weak buildings. 5,475 kilometers away, breaks glass. People that would survive in Atlas or Mantle without an airship this time? 0%. Either by having their body shredded by air or being crushed with 364 Gs of force due to deacceleration. In either case, you would be killed so fast that you wouldn't even feel the pain before dying. It's possible an explosion of this scale would cause an ice age. Now I just have one question for you. Was that a big enough explosion? Yeah, you'll do. Right, I think that's enough learning for one class. Class dismissed. Ugh, my brain has melted after all those big numbers, but you should remember to rate this lesson a thumbs up. Leave any questions in the comments section. Subscribes are always appreciated. And press the bell so you're never late for class. Bye. Bye.
I still can't wait to learn about gravity and wormholes. I wonder when that lesson will be.